This week I'll be reviewing uh, this Bible here. It is the Schofield Study Bible 3 in the New King James Version. My copy is in burgundy genuine leather from Oxford University Press. Let's take a look at the box. Gives you a text sample. This is the price sticker on it, but uh, I bought mine from Christian Book Distributors in 2010 and paid $45 for it. That's the uh, style 474RRL. Let's look at the back. Let me tell you a bit about the history of the Schofields here in this timeline and quite a lot about key facts here. They have 100 box factual articles, expanded subject index, side column references, which I like. They're on the outsides of the columns. 550 in-text definitions of proper names, etc., etc. So we will open the book up and start looking at it. After I give you the dimensions, it is 9 and 3 eighths inches tall, 6 and 11 sixteenths inches wide, a nine, uh, one and nine sixteenths inches thick. So it's a, uh, it's a comfortable size. It's not too large for a study Bible. Most of them are huge and bulky these days. It's formatted in two columns of text per page, in a verse by verse format. Each column is about forty seven millimeters wide. Together, that distance is about ninety eight millimeters. I count about 37 characters per line, so to me that's quite nice. It's not a bad uh, distance per line at all. A lot of people like their columns to be wider, uh, particularly in the poetry sections, but 37 uh, and I get along just fa famously. I count as many as 58 lines of text per page. Uh, you won't get that here, but if you go back, say, into numbers, we probably can find easily a page that has all 58 lines on it. Page dimensions are 9 inches tall, it is 6 and 1 eighths inches wide, so in metric uh, units that's 228 millimeters tall, 157 millimeters wide. The uh, margins at the top of the page are 16 to 17 millimeters, it dances around a bit the bottom of the page, below the bottom line of text, is 9 to 12 millimeters. The inner margin can be as much as 28 millimeters. It's a bit less than that here in the center of the book. And the outer margin is 28 to 30 millimeters wide. You get the references in both the inner and the outer margins. The font here in the text is about 9.5 points for capital letters. It's about 10 points for the lowercase letters. The line height is 3.44 millimeters, that's about nine and three quarters points, and I think you'll agree with me that it's quite generous line spacing. I think that is easy on the eyes and quite pleasant. Verse numbers, as you see, are alongside the verses, making the verses very easy to find, but quite clearly, if you look here, you can see that this text is not line matched. Words that are added by the translators are in an, ob in an oblique font. Here we have the word there, added by the translators for clarity, and you see that's oblique. I think the ink is very nice and dark, which helps with this show-through problem, which is quite obvious. You can see that there. References, as we mentioned, are in the outer columns. The uh, font here in these references is about seven and a half points and they point to the back to the index of chain references. I will show you that index in just a moment. The um, paper is quite nice. Its uh, sheet thickness is 33 and a third uh, micrometers. I estimate the paper weight at 30 GSM. The surface is quite matte. It's not doesn't have much of a sheen to it at all. It's more of a glare. 
It's a white paper with a hint of baby powder, so there's a slight yellowish tinge to it. And as we mentioned, it is not as opaque as it could be. There's quite a lot of show through. Here you're seeing an illustration from the very next page. And it's quite visible. There is some print non-uniformity. Let's look at here. We're at uh, 1166. Let me flip over to 1182. I'll show you those two pages together to give you a sense for how it varies. I tried to find maximum variation. And I think you can tell that it is darker on the right than on the left, but not greatly so. The left is printed sufficiently darkly so that it doesn't cause me any trouble at least. Uh, in the red, it is a red letter Bible. In the red, let's look at pages 1321 and 1327. There's 1321, and there's 1327. And here, the darker print is on the left. But again, the print on the right is just not that faint. It doesn't cause me any kind of issue, at least. Each uh, book of the Bible has its own introduction. So here for Matthew, you have information like author, theme, date of writing, background. God's relation with man, Old Testament and the New, and then an outline of the book. The um, book titles are at the top of the page. This is perhaps the only real design flaw here that I think should be on the outside top to make it easier to find what book you're in as you flip through. Table uh, Page contents are here in the center. so. 118, Matthew 118 is the first verse here. 2 4 is the last verse on the page. Page numbers are on the outside top. Uh, there are headings in the text, as you see here. There are in a nine point oblique font. There are um, chapter numbers that are very large and bold, so you have no difficulty here whatsoever finding what chapter you're in or what verse you're in in that chapter. Books of the Bible all begin on a separate page. As we've already noted, the words of Christ are in red, but happily the red here is not too bright, it's not pink, and it is not faint. So all in all, it's not horrible. Uh, quotations uh, from the Old Testament are in an oblique font. Let me see if I can show you that. It should be easy to find here in Matthew. So you can see that's oblique. It's not italic because the A is made as, as a regular upright A is made. The Bible has the normal 66 books of the Protestant canon. And then at the end of the book of Revelation you have some assistance here. A number of appendices. A two-page appendix on monies, weights, and measures. You have a uh, seven-page index of chain topics. These map to those references that are in the side columns. This is in the font that's somewhere between seven and seven and a half points. Three columns per page, and we mentioned seven pages. It's a subject index. This is 38 pages long, three columns per page in the same size font, and it covers topics that appear in Scripture and in all the notes at the bottom of the page. So we'll go forward to what should be an index of proper names. I think that's where we are here. Index of proper names, again, this is in that same 7 plus point font. Again, three columns per page, and there are 30 pages or so of proper names. So here's Horan. It tells you how to pronounce it, and then it means hollow land and where to find a reference. 
and then you have a concordance in addition to everything else. So again, three columns, it's 102 pages long, 7 plus point font, all the entries are in uh, caps and bold, like here, and then all the context lines here are in a normal sort of font, 7 seven-ish point font. After the 102 page concordance, we come to a several page long map index. It's five pages long. New Oxford Bible Maps index to the maps. So they tell you um, the map number and then, so that's map 6, and then the grid square, so it's grid square x5 for that particular entry. Again, it's in that 7-ish point font. After those five pages, we come to the Oxford maps. These are very nice maps. I've always liked the Oxford maps. They are on a flat surface, so people that like to write on them don't have to worry about their ink running. Why you would write on a map, I don't know. Particularly when they're this beautiful. But uh, some people do. They do not go into the gutter. Very detailed, very pretty. And Oxford has upgraded these, and I'll be showing the upgraded maps in a review I'll do here in a week or two. Of the 5th uh, edition of the new Oxford Annotated Bible in the new revised standard version. After all these beautiful maps, background of the New Testament here, Jerusalem in the times of the New Testament, you can see the one yellow ribbon, which I have tucked into the back. The ribbon is only seven millimeters wide. It's uh, shiny on both sides. It's 316 millimeters long, so it does extend beyond the corner of the Bible, but not by a lot. There are golden burgundy head and tail bands, very attractively done. It's a sewn binding. Uh, it does lie nearly flat. Let's show that. So there it is lying open early in Genesis. There is overcast stitching in the front and the back, and if we can get the right angle, you can see it here, running along the left-hand page. So that reinforces the book at either end. It's actually quite well made. The uh, edges are gilt, very nice and shiny. My particular edition has the thumb indexing. I don't normally go for thumb indexing. It may have been at the time that that was all that was available, but those are very nicely done as well. Um, we mentioned it's burgundy and genuine leather, so that's not as good as top grain leather, but that's better than bonded leather. It's a paste down construction, so this liner is pasted to the leather cover, and then this side of the liner is glued to cardstock. So it's not as flexible as an edge-lined one, where you would have a very flexible liner on the left, and you'd have a tab running in here to connect the line, liner to the end pages. There is a very attractive, but not decorative, that is not detailed, uh, simple line, gold boundary around the page. In the front, after a couple of pages of cardstock, you have some heavy yellow and textured paper. Let's see if you can see the texture here. Not sure if that's showing up on the camera. I can definitely feel it with my fingers. Maybe if I turn off one of these lamps for a second, get a better view of it. The textured surface here. has a presentation page, um, certificate of marriage, births, and a record of other marriages, record of deaths, 
a note about the centennial edition of the Schofield Study Bible. Which goes on for several pages. Uh, first title page, second title page, saying it's from Oxford University Press. Here's the copyright page for Oxford University Press. New King James Version copyright. This is the 84 text, not the 82 text, even though the copyright is from 82. And I'll show you in a few moments how to tell that if you have the 82 text or the later 84 text. Interior design and typesetting by Blue, Blue Heron Bookcraft, Battleground, Washington. I have a couple of Bibles that they've done the font for. I really think this is an attractive font in this Bible. I think they do very good work. And mine was printed in Korea. Contributors, C.I. Schofield, just like in the original. Uh, and then, consulting editor for, oh, it gives you the revision committee from, eight, from 1967, and the consulting editor for 1989, the New King James edition, which was Arthur Farstad, who was the executive editor of the New King James Version, and the name of the contributing editor. Table of Contents, an introduction talking about the Schofield Reference Bible, the preface to the New King James Version, which shows up in almost every New King James Version I've seen, how to use the Study Bible. overall plan of the Bible. And you're at the beginning of the Old Testament where you have a little boxed article about the Pentateuch before the introductory material about the book of Genesis. Now we are in uh, 1 Peter 3.20 and I just wanted to show the font up close <coughs> and the uh, tracking. The tracking I think is just a little bit on the tight side in places. Look at the way those letters are very tightly packed there and long suffering. I would prefer something spaced out a bit more than that. And we talked about the line spacing earlier and I think it's uh, it's pretty good. You have a, a gap here between a capital D and the descender of the Y above it, so that's not bad. Let's just take a look at the capital D and confirm the uh, measurement of the size. So here's a 9.5 point times New Roman T. And it looks like it's fairly close to the same size as the capital D. That's how I come up with 9.5 points. <clears throat> Tracking line spacing are all quite good. Now, I promised earlier to show you how to tell the 82 from the 84 New King James Version. As far as I know, the 1984 update is the only update that's ever been made to the New King James Version. You see there in this 1984 in KJV, it says, When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. I'm going to show you now, see if we can maintain focus. I'll zoom out a bit. The um, 1982 text, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So, go to First Peter 3:20. If it says divine long suffering, you have the 84 and later editions of the New King James Version. If it says long suffering of God, you have the original 82, and I like the 82 better. Another place I like to check in a New King James Version Bible is uh, Colossians 2.8 because it has an odd translation and it's very helpful if it has a footnote, a translation note here. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. Cheat sounds curious translation there. And um, in some New King James Version Bibles they will have a 
t uh, translation note at that point and explain to you what's actually meant. So I'll zoom out just a bit so I can squeeze in my single column hardback in the comfort print. And we'll look at 2.8 here. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. And you look at cheat and it has a 1. And we go over here to the margin for 2.8 find it and it says literally plunder you or take you captive so that's actually I think much better than the word cheat here the um, Schofield New King James Version does not have that kind of a translation note if we zoom down to the bottom of the page we'll see the New King James Version textual notes, text, text critical notes that talk about the Nestle Aland United Bible Society's text and how um, the underlying Greek varies in those Greek New Testaments versus the Textus Receptus which uh, the New King James Version translates but you do not see the translation notes that are often printed in New King James Version Bibles at this point in the video, I'd like to attempt some font comparisons. The Schofield 3 in the New King James Version is on the stand, and I'm going to bring in from the right the original Schofield text so that you can see the two fonts side by side. I think the uh, newer font is more attractive, it's larger, um, better line spacing. So I do like it better than the original font that was used in the 1917. 1917, of course, isn't the original. 1909 was the original. Um, this is the 1967 Schofield on the right. I think this 67 Schofield had better line spacing than the 1917 Schofield did. And the font on the right is quite attractive too. I actually think it has better tracking than the newer Schofield 3 on the left. And this is the NKG, NKJV Comfort Print Thin Line that was published in the summer of 2018. It's a larger, very attractive font. But again, although the one on the left is smaller, um, I find it quite attractive too. I do like the font here in the Schofield 3. In this portion of the video, um, we'll take a look at the notes. Uh, most, of, most of them are in two columns like this. And they have uh, the verse number and the um, phrase in the verse that they're making reference to in bold. So here in 12.7, they're making a note it has to do with the words the Lord appeared you can see also there's a typo it actually reads the Lord appeared some of the notes are in a, a box to draw your attention to them so here's a note at 12.1 on the fourth dispensation that a promise and uh, you can pause the video to read that at your leisure I'm not going to talk about it here except to point out that there's an interesting omission when compared with the 1917 Schofield, which if you read here, it says the dispensation of promise ended when Israel rashly accepted the law. So Israel rashly accepted the law in Exodus 19.8. And I find no, no such statement here in the Schofield 3. This is the note at uh, Exodus 19.3. The previous one was in Genesis, at Genesis 12.1. And I want to point out a couple of things. One is, I've, if I've not mentioned it elsewhere in the videos, the notes are in about an eight and a half point font. That is, the capital letters are about the same height as a Times New Roman eight and a half point capital. Um, in this particular note at uh, Exodus 19.3, 
it has a very good statement here because one of the problems with dispensationalism is it's given the impression, at least some of the notes in the 1909 and the 1917 Schofields, that it was teaching two different ways of salvation. This note makes it very clear that the law is not here proposed as a means of salvation but as a means by which Israel, already redeemed as a nation, might through obedience fulfill her prosper, proper destiny as a people for God's possession and a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Now compare that with the note in the 1917 Schofield at 19.3. Zoom out a bit so we can see the whole thing. And the key here is that it says the law is not proposed as a means of life. So um, the more modern editions of the Schofield, I believe the 1967 started this, they changed means of life to means of salvation to make it very clear that they're not talking about two different ways of salvation. Now we are at um, the note at John 117. This is one of those boxed notes, and it's the summary note on grace. And uh, you can pause the video and read it if you'd like. I just want to draw your attention to the second portion of it, which reads in part, In its fullness, grace began with the ministry of Christ. So grace didn't begin then, but the fullness of grace began with the ministry of Christ, involving his death and resurrection. Then later it says, prior to the cross, man's salvation was through faith, being grounded on Christ's atoning sacrifice. And I just want to show you how that has changed since the 1917 Schofield, which read, as a dispensation, grace begins with the death and resurrection of Christ. And it says, the point of testing is no longer legal obedience as the condition of salvation, which is one of those points in the older Schofield that made people think that dispensationalists were teaching two ways of salvation, one under the law and then a later one under grace. For our final note, we'll look at this one here on Revelation 13.11, which has to do with the Antichrist. And I just want to point out that it's um, not altogether certain um, in terms of who the Antichrist is. It says many identify the beast coming out of the earth as the Antichrist. Uh, this would be the false prophet. But uh, they say um, Antichrist is never directly referred to him, and some consider the term Antichrist as applying to the first beast, who is the political ruler. So that's the beast from the sea. And I think it's this later view in the note that's much more common today, although I'm by, by no means an expert in the way dispensationalists understand this. I want to just contrast that tone of that note with what was said here in the earlier Schofield, which said um, the Antichrist, who is, and no ifs, ands, or buts about it, the Antichrist is the beast out of the earth and the false prophet. He is the ecclesiastical, the last ecclesiastical head. Here is a Bible stack uh, for size comparison purposes. The book on the top is a local church Bible publisher's 1917 Schofield. And the book we're reviewing is here, the lower one, Schofield 3. Schofield 3 is definitely taller, thicker, and wider than the original Schofield. But compared with the ESV Study Bible, this is a, an older one from about 2011 in calfskin that I have. It is not quite as tall, much thinner, uh, about the same width. We're ready for a summary. Um, there's a lot that I like about this book. It's uh, an Oxford Bible, and Oxford Bibles are generally well constructed. This one's certainly not an exception. It's sewn. Uh, it's my sewn. It has overcast stitching front and back. Very nice paper. I like the paper, though I wish it were more, more opaque. I like the fact, the feel of it, kind of a cottony texture to it. It's a softer paper, no sheen to it. 
seems to take the ink quite well. Um, it is not line matched, um, but it's printed quite well, in my perspective at least. And I think there's something about, at least for my physiology, uh, having a kind of a poor signal to noise ratio because the signal here is dark on a dark background actually works better for me than having a poor signal to noise ratio due to a light signal on a light background. I think if, the, if, if what I'm trying to read is dark then my brain at least makes up for the fact that there's a lot of show through. It doesn't bother me that much. I like the double column format. I like the narrow columns. I know a lot of people like their columns broader than this, but I like the narrow ones. The verse by verse format uh, helps break up the reading. It slows me down and helps me concentrate on what it is I'm trying to read. I like the references in the sides. Uh, this particular design um, places them kind of about the center of the column. So you don't have to go that far if you're looking for the note on verse 20 here in Exodus uh, Leviticus 25. It's right here. And the note down here on verse 30 is just here. Some Bibles push them all into one pl place, like either at the, the bottom or the top of the column. I think this sort of symmetric format works quite well. Um, the, uh, the notes themselves are dispensational, and uh, even if you aren't a dispensationalist, and I'm not, I think it's useful to have references that explain that perspective, which is still quite prevalent in the evangelical Christian world. So I like that uh, I like that aspect of the Bible just for that reason and for no other. The red letters are red, and to my mind that's a bad thing, but they are fairly dark, and so that doesn't bother me that much. I don't find myself reading the Gospels in this Bible for any length of time because it, uh, it's not a pleasant experience, but it could be a lot worse. That is, that red is nice and dark, and it certainly is readable. The translation here is very good. I like the New King James Version. Now, as I've mentioned uh, several times, I don't really understand. Don't I haven't studied Hebrew, so I don't know how well it translates the Old Testament. But the New Testament, I think, is uh, quite literal. Um, on the downside, if you do not think that the Textus Receptus is um, a very good Greek base for the New Testament, then you'll be disappointed in the New King James Version because it does use the Textus Receptus. It does mitigate that by having footnotes like these, which show textual variants. So NU was the uh, critical text edition at the time it was published in the 80s, which was probably the uh, United Bible Society's uh, third edition text. Um, M is the majority text, that's the Hodges Farstad majority text. So it does show often, it shows where other Greek New Testaments differ from the Textus Receptus. It doesn't do it always. And at the end of this video, I will show a series of charts that I prepared for another video. But I'll tag them on here just to keep make them more accessible. And uh, also there's one new chart, or maybe two new charts, where I found more instances where the New King James Version uh, overlooks some of the uh, textual variants. Also there's a chart here that talks about uh, how some of these notes here need to be revised since the, uh, the N and the U and NU have changed over time. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I've enjoyed making it. Uh, if you did, please remember to like the video, and uh, if you haven't done so, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.